in just a moment. All right, let's go ahead and get started. We apologize. We had a little bit of a delay this morning or this afternoon now uh, to get started, but we're going to go ahead and move forward. I want to welcome everybody to lunch with ZHF and today's topic of remote working tax issues amid the pandemic. My name is Tom Zano and I serve as managing member of Zano Hall and Farron LLC. And we are a law firm that focuses on two things, multi-state tax and government affairs matters. We're so glad you're joining us today and we hope that you have your lunch ready or maybe you've already started it. But I expect today's program to be informative and entertaining. Now, before I begin, I do need to cover a couple of housekeeping items. I need you to understand that while today's program is sponsored by the law firm of Zano Hall and Farron, you need to understand that all of the panelists comments, including those of ZHF professionals are provided for general guidance only and do not constitute the provision of legal accounting or professional advice of any kind. So before making any tax decision or taking any tax action, we always recommend that you should consult with a professional advisor who's been provided with all the pertinent facts relevant to your particular situation. If you're joining us today on YouTube, I invite you to please click the subscribe button below to get further updates about future Lunch with ZHF events. Or you can also go to our website at zhftaxlaw.com and sign up for our buzz and we will email you those updates. Now as moderator, I have a number of questions for our panelists today, but viewers may also submit their questions using the chat function. Our time is rather short, but we will get to as many of those questions as we possibly can. Today, we brought together a terrific panel of tax professionals from the private sector, a tax authority, and elected officials as well. We provided links to each of our panelists' bios on our website, but please let me int briefly introduce them. First, we have Senator Christina Rogner of the 27th Senate District, which covers Wayne County and parts of Summit and Stark County. Before going into politics, Senator Rogner worked in business, including as a management consultant at McKinsey & Company. She currently serves as chair of the Senate Ways and Means Committee. Also from the Ohio General Assembly, we have Representative Gary Shear of the 92nd House District, which covers Fayette County and parts of Pickway and Ross County. Mr. Shear is a CPA and was instrumental with the House Bill 5 municipal income tax reform. He currently serves on the House Ways and Means, Finance, and most recently, the Rules Committee. Next, we have Eleanor Palmer, who's a tax attorney in the Office of General Counsel at Nationwide Insurance. Eleanor also serves as chair of the Ohio Chamber of, Ta of Commerce's Tax Committee. From Washington, D.C. today, we have Fred Nicely, who serves as tax counsel for the Council on State Taxation, otherwise known as COST. Before joining COST, Fred served as Chief Counsel at the Ohio Department of Taxation. We also have Amy Arrighi, who serves as General Counsel of the Regional Income Tax Agency, commonly referred to as RITA. What you may or may not know is that RITA administers approximately 60% of the over 600 municipal income taxes that are imposed by different cities. Finally, we have Steve Hall, who is a fellow member of mine with Zeta Hall and Farron. Prior to going into the private practice of law, Steve served as assistant counsel with the Department of Taxation, and he covers many multi-state tax areas, including state and local income tax issues. I want to welcome the panelists today, and uh, we appreciate you participating. Now, our goal today is to highlight the tax issues that businesses must consider as the pandemic continues. You know, there are a lot of benefits of working from home. I always think that it's it's been really interesting to be able to get a little glimpse or a window into a fellow business colleague's home environment, whether it's because they've got a dog or a cat that's barking or meowing in the background or jumping on their lap or they have their kids running around. Now, in my case, of course, you see, I've got my signed autographs from Lee Majors and Lindsey Wagner, and hopefully most of you people know who those folks are. But what it really shows is I'm not just a tax geek, I'm really still just a nerd all the way around. But while there's benefits to working remotely, there's also a lot of tax issues. And we're not going to solve all those issues today, 
but we're certainly going to make you aware of them and how they may impact your businesses, allowing you the opportunity to understand them a little better and then figure out for your own purposes how you might want to try and mitigate those impacts. We're going to cover some national, state, and local developments, but we would like to start off with the one that we've been dealing with the most. During the last several months, the single biggest issue that we've been assisting clients with is the Ohio Municipal Income Tax Withholding Rules. Unlike many states, Ohio has over 600 taxing jurisdictions, each city imposing their own income tax. Not every city, but certainly most cities. And the way it works is that wages are subject to tax in two places. First, in the city where the wages are actually earned, and then second, in the employee's home city. Now, the impact on employers is that employers are required to withhold municipal income taxes for the city in which the wages are actually earned. That means employers who have their employees working in other than just one location have to track day by day and hour by hour where their employees are located geographically and then figure out how much tax they have to withhold for each of those taxing jurisdictions. It's a big job. Now there's an exception to this general uh, withholding rule and it's commonly referred to as the occasional entrant rule or simply the 20 day rule. Steve Hall, why don't you briefly describe how the 20 day rule works before the pandemic? Because I think it's important for our understanding as we move forward in today's discussion. Sure. Um, so the policy of the 20 day rule is let's not make employers withhold tax if someone works just a few days of the year in that particular municipality. It's a convenience of employer rule but I want to emphasize it's not mandatory. Employees, employers are free to withhold everywhere the person works, but that's not always practical. I refer to it as a shield to the taxpayer, not a sword to the government. So if you seek to use it, this is how it applies. The employer is not required to withhold tax for a city where the employee works fewer than 20 days, so long as that employer withholds tax to the principal place of work city for those days, assuming that's in a taxable jurisdiction. The principal place of work is in a township, then it doesn't apply because there's no tax to be required to be withheld there. The way it works is there are measurements. A day, for example, is measured by a preponderance of the day test. You count the most hours of the day where that person worked, and that is that counts as a day. For example, when we are measuring a day, it relates only to whether you get to the 21 days or not. It has nothing to do with anything else. There are rules about commuting time and where the commuting time is deemed to be occurring, um, which, which effectively uh, moves that time to the principal place of work city. But again, counting the days is only to see if you meet the safe harbor or not. The principal place of work is defined as the regular and ordinary fixed location where someone is required to report on an ordinary and necessary basis. That, if that doesn't exist, then you, there's another taxating test uh, that you can use to decide where the principal place of work city is. Most of the confusion, though, is nowhere in the law does it say the employer must withhold the principal place of work city. They are supposed to withhold where it is earned, and this 20-day rule is just an exception to that that can be used by employers. So with this 20-day rule, maybe I could ask Eleanor to talk about what are the challenges for companies trying to comply with the withholding provisions? So, yeah, the obvious one is, you know, trying to keep track of your employee workforce. And I will say I like I like Steve your language about it being being a shield um, because we do use that as a shield and we feel like we're in compliance with that. On the flip side, though, I do know that we have some employees that track where they work, um, you know, down to the to the to the day to the hour, and then they do file refunds um, with the various municipalities so that they can basically true up and reconcile their personal tax liability at the end of the year. Yeah. So, and, and that's right. So employers may withhold the, the principal place of work, 
but if an employee doesn't actually work at that location on different periods during the year, the employee traditionally has been able to get refunds. Isn't that correct? Yes, that's absolutely correct. I mean, we know yeah. of, you know, some of our salespeople that do a lot of traveling, you know, out of state, in state, um, and it's mostly out of state. And so they, you know, will, will you know, come to us because we have to sign off on their form. But it's basically them applying for the refund from the city of Columbus. And so what's happened is that my understanding is with sending, you know, we've had these companies that really haven't had to face this problem too much because they've got big offices in various cities. But now with COVID, they've had to send those folks home to work remotely. And the General Assembly back in March uh, passed and enacted into law House Bill 197, which had already made its way through the House, was pending in the Senate. And they used that bill as a, a mechanism to address various types of issues related to the COVID-19 pandemic, <clears throat> including tax issues. And as it relates to municipal income tax withholding and, and municipal income taxes, they enacted what I refer to as Section 29, because that's an uncodified provision of the bill. What I'd like to do is just let me briefly kind of summarize what Section 29 does. And then I'm going to ask Amy, uh, Reggie from Rita, how, how she thinks it applies. So in response, again, the General Assembly enacted this provision that says, notwithstanding the 20-day rule provisions in the revised code, as well as the other provisions in the revised code related to municipal income tax, during the period of the emergency that's been declared by the governor, any day on which an employee performs personal services at a location, including the employee's home, to which the employee is required to report for employment duties because of the declaration, is deemed to be a day of performing personal services at the employee's principal place of work. So basically, we're saying here, the General Assembly is saying, we're deeming that day to be a day of performing personal services at the employee's principal place of work. Amy, how have cities interpreted what Section 29 means, how it applies? Uh, thanks, Tom. Um, you know, it's clear that the Section 29 language really acted as a uh, stabilizer. Uh, so in other words, you know, employers had the relief of knowing that they could send their employees home and that that 20 day rule was not going to kick in on them after they've had their employees home for uh, four weeks. Uh, for municipalities, it also provided some stabilizing in that they were uh, could still count on the same level of municipal income tax withholding coming in as they had uh, prior to the pandemic. So, so really that's how, you know, it was seen as, as a stabilizer, kind of keeping the status quo, uh, not only for employers, but also uh, for municipalities. So Amy, we, we talked just a little bit ago about how the employer Eased later names for those days which they didn't work in the, in the principal place of work that the employer may be withheld. Do you think that this language impacts the ability of those employees to file refund claims next year for 2020? Well, Tom, that, that's really been a question since this language came out. And of course, refunds aren't discussed at all in this language. Uh, recently, uh, a Columbus employer, the, the Buckeye Institute, has filed a declaratory action uh, case in the Franklin County Common Pleas Court to basically answer that question. Uh, that The Buckeye Institute has an office in Columbus. Uh, on the stay of at home order being issued, it sent its employees to work from home and continue to withhold Columbus income tax from the wages of those employees and now is seeking a declaration from the courts uh, that that withholding should be refunded uh, as those employees were actually performing work outside of the city of Columbus. Uh, so the, the matter will be litigated and we'll be watching that to see how that might impact that refund question next year. Okay, and maybe we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about that. Steve, what do you see as some of the ambiguities in, in section 29? Sure. Um, I think it's it's interesting that the General Assembly chose the word day. They said 
shall be deemed to be a day performing personal services. They didn't say it's deemed earned there, uh, which is where the taxes are due and levied. The taxes are levied where it's earned. The use of the word day in the chapter 718, which is the municipal income tax system, it's only relevant for the 20 day rule. The principal place of work definition is only relevant for the 20 day rule. Uh, it doesn't say uh, where earned. And I, I, you know, I searched before the, the program this morning and the word day is used 143 times in the chapter. Every single time it's either related to the 20 day rule, which is the de minimis safe harbor or you know, due dates of return or due dates of payment. So in my view, uh, the General Assembly's intent was merely to maintain the safe harbor for the employer to not have to withhold tax in the bedroom communities where the people are working. And it did not address the ultimate tax. You know, there's some due process problems and some extra, extra territorial taxation issues with um, trying to tax an individual on income not earned in the jurisdiction that's trying to tax them. There's some truck driver cases. Uh, there's that uh, Ohio Supreme Court case, cases, Hill and Meyer and Saturday, involving the athletes who, who didn't work in the city as much as the city tried to tax them. So in my view, um, it's not crystal clear, but I think the key is the use of the word day performing services, which is only relevant for the 20 day minute. Okay. Eleanor, what do you see as the issues on Section 29? Does it help or hurt and how it might apply to businesses? So I think that when it came out, it was definitely seen as a help because I think, as Amy pointed out, um, employers were, you know, this happens so quickly. If we take ourselves back to March and remember, um, you know, the Arnold got shut down and then you know, the NBA canceled their seat. You know, it was things were happening so fast and boom, we were going home. We were sending all of our employees home. And so it was a frantic question of, well, what do we do about withholding? Because we know that, you know, Ohio has this, you know, span of municipalities. And so looking at that statute, it was helpful. Okay, good. We can breathe the sigh of relief. We don't have to rush and try to figure out all the tax jurisdictions and we can maintain status quo. But I never thought that this was changing the tax regime, so to speak, of the cities and basically saying that employees would not be able to then get their true accurate picture of where they worked for the entire year, because I think that would require a lot more discussion a lot more um, rigorous debate about the rule. I, I just feel like this was a, a stopgap just for employers. Okay. So we have with us Representative Gary Shear, who was involved in, in uh, getting Section 29 into House Bill 197. I kind of like to ask Mr. Shear, what did you, what did the General Assembly think? Now, and I caution uh, all the participants. You know, when it comes to actual case law in Ohio and that sort of thing, you can't really rely on what the General Assembly intended. But I think for purposes of today's discussion, it might be interesting to understand well, what at least Mr. Shear, maybe Senator Rugner, uh, thought was intended. So, Mr. Shear, could you talk about that? Well, first of all, Tom, this is not the first time you or, or many people have asked me what in I the world were you thinking? Um, can can we hear Mr. Shear? I can. I, I can okay. hear Representative Shear. Okay. I think the rest of us can. So keep 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 going. Um, anyway, that, uh, there's, there's plenty of of uh, areas uh, of tax law, but. Uh, areas of my, lo my uh, life that I get asked, what in the world are you thinking? This isn't an unusual question. Um, the, uh, the answer to it is, I mean, first of all, uh, this was, you know, the COVID pandemic hit, stay at home order, you know, very quickly. Um, we received from the administration, the legislature uh, received from the administration a, a long 
list of different items that we thought needed to be addressed and addressed quickly um, related to the COVID uh, pandemic. Um, it, it, I did, uh, it did confirm uh, just before the, uh, the call here uh, that my recollection was was right with uh, with our policy staff, and it was the, the intent was absolutely to simplify uh, compliance uh, for the employers and employees, um, and it, on what was you know is is temporary um, and hopefully short term. Turns out it's probably longer term than any of us uh, wanted it to be, but um, the the uh, the event was a short-term uh, abate of the, the, the withholding rules. Um, Steve, you point out, you know, the emphasis on the word day. I will tell you that, that I don't, in any converse I was involved with, it wasn't an intentional, um, oh, we better use the word day so it only applies to the 20-day uh, rule. Um, it, the, the best of my understanding, uh, the intent was wouldn't change the, uh, the presumed source of uh, place of the earnings uh, as well. So it, uh, you know, as, as Eleanor pointed out, you know, a lot of, a lot of people who have, let's say, Columbus um, income tax withheld, but they're working outside of that jurisdiction, um, do file for a refund back in the CPA firm. We had field audit staff uh, uh, to get a refund from the uh, the, the primary uh, uh, place of employment. Uh, now, this kind of messes with that. So the bottom line is um, it, it was quite frankly, and I think understandably done in a hurry. Um, it was intended to make things simpler for both employees and employers. It wasn't intended to, to, uh, to be a, a long-term uh, change in the the uh, tax scheme. Sure, thank you, uh, Senator Rogner. Last week, you introduced Senate Bill three fifty two, and I know you've heard from a lot of constituents. May, why don't you talk about what you've heard and what, what the purpose is of Senate Bill three fifty two? Uh, yeah, thank you, Tom. So, I'm, if I could just back up first, uh, when we passed you know, House Bill one ninety seven. Uh, I think Amy hit the nail on the head when she said it was to act as a stabilizer uh, because, as she mentioned, things were closing fast. Things were being canceled. They were falling like dominoes. Um, schools, uh, BMVs, uh, everything was just shutting down, and the General Assembly had to come back and, uh, and, and very quickly uh, pass a bill that addressed you know, these end-of-course exams for kids and teacher uh, evaluations and the number of days in school. Can these kids still graduate? Can people still drive on expired licenses if they can't get to the BMV? And then, of course, this municipal tax issue as well. Uh, so the intention was, at least from my perspective, um, was to act as a stabilizer, both for the businesses, but also for uh, um, the municipalities. Now, uh, but the underlying intention of what we had in place before this bill was uh, you, you, you pay your taxes to where you earn or where you earn your money, where you're working. And, and that makes sense because that's the location that's going to provide your police, your EMS, your, your services. Um, so, but, but now the fact of the matter is uh, people are, you know, many people are working from home. They live at home, they work from home, um, they, they, they stay right around their home area. And so that's the municipality that's going to be providing you those services. So it, it just made sense. And I was hearing from constituents uh, and just a lot of folks across my district and across the state, quite frankly, that, you know, why aren't we sending the tax dollars uh, to the municipalities that are providing us the services? Uh, so that's why I introduced um, the, the Senate bill recently, uh, just because it's a, to me, it's an issue of fairness. Uh, those municipalities that are providing the services should get the taxes. Sure. That's great. You know, and just so that folks understand what the bill does say, it's a very short bill. It says Section 29 is repealed. Pretty, pretty easy. Yeah. Um, now, I think it might be the shortest bill I've ever introduced, Tom. It's just, it is one. <laughs> that's uh, right. It's an easy read. The, uh, the bill summary, I'm sure, is going to be much longer than the bill itself. 
But right. I would like to point right. out something. Um, and Gary might have mentioned this before he was saying, uh, but uh, even if this bill that I've introduced doesn't go into effect, uh, as soon as this pandemic is over, or 30 days after it, uh, we're going to go revert back to what was in uh, law before, and that is you're you're earning, uh, you're paying your taxes where you earn them, uh, and and um, you know I think I, I you know I have to say a lot of people are enjoying this whole Zoom thing and and this video conferencing, and uh, I think a lot you know some people obviously will go back to their place of employment, but I, I would uh, anticipate that there'll be a lot of folks that'll be working from home more even when the pandemic's over uh, or working remotely. Uh, and just because I think we're kind of getting used to it over these last several months. So, uh, you know, when even if, even if this Senate bill uh, uh, 352, you know, doesn't take effect and we revert back to current law, uh, you know, people will be working from home and they'll be paying taxes there. Sure. Fred Nicely, from out of Washington, D.C., you know, you deal with a lot of companies nationwide and state tax and local systems nationally. I mean, What's the thought about Ohio's municipal tax and maybe the solution that's pre been presented here to deal with at least remote working amid the COVID pandemic? Thanks, Tom. And I'm about 1,500 feet from the Capitol. So, you know, I, I feel so powerful right now. Uh, <laughs> even though Congress is not in session. But I, I'd like to, you know, give the Ohio General Assembly a compliment, but also a complaint. And I really do give them a compliment for what they put in 197. I think, you know, there was a strong intent to help employers um, during this uh, COVID-19 crisis, where should they be withholding um, individuals' income tax? And trying to figure out where everyone's working at home when you're normally withholding from a work location, that's not easy to do. So I think, you know, the spirit of the legislation, I give uh, the General Assembly a lot of uh, compliments on it. I, one of the things I thought that should have been in there um, that, you know, we would have been ad advocating for is that employers that have tracking systems um, where they're able to keep track of where their employees are working, they should be able to opt out and um, not be able to use a formal principal work location. Um, but a major complaint I have is just over what withholding is. Withholding is estimated tax. It is not the actual tax obligation that an employee owes. It's just the employer withholding estimated tax. No different than a withholding that we have for federal individual income tax or state individual tax. It's not the actual tax liability. And I think, you know, trying to blur withholding into where the actual um, tax liability is. Um, and then the municipal income tax, as Steve had noted, is very much based on where it's earned. That, you know, would be my complaint, that, that, that there shouldn't be that mixing there. And, um, you know, if uh, Senate Bill 352, uh, if it can uh, move, um, you know, Senator, I, I appreciate short bills, um, but uh, if a little bit more enhanced language could be added to that to give direction, um, more direction on um, how the whole process uh, should work, um, that would be helpful. Great, thank you for that input. That's great. Um, and, and so Eleanor, you know, Fred raised a couple issues about, and you had mentioned earlier about, you know, having data. I mean. Can you talk a little bit about what the challenge is for companies to even know where their employees are located? Yeah, so we have, you know, we, we keep in our, in our payroll system, obviously their work location, but we also have their home address. And so we know, you know, when we send everybody home, theoretically, we know where their home is. Um, but we don't know is we've never gone into the system and mapped that address to the actual tax jurisdiction and map that to, okay, what's the rate that we've been withholding and what's the rule? We've never done that. And so to go through and take, I think there might be 10,000 um, employees in the downtown area, you know, to do that for 10,000 employees you know, is quite, a, quite an exercise. Um, and so I, I do appreciate the General Assembly thinking about this because it was top of our mind. Um, but now <laughs> no one expected this to be, you know, five months, six months, you know, the rest of the year. So we're in this, we're in this place. You know, our employees are asking us, why do I have to keep paying Columbus tax? Mm -hmm. And we we don't have a solid answer. It's a tough one. It's a tough one. Tell them to call their lawyer. Well, we're, we're relying on, I mean, we're relying on um, 
you know, House Bill 197, which, you know, we're under the emergency order, but then, you know, we're thrown for a loop when we get, uh, you know, Senate Bill 352 on the table. And, um, you know, just want to understand better what should we do because we are withholding. I mean, like Fred says, it is an estimate of taxes, but if those taxes are never going to be due, then we probably shouldn't be withholding them. Right, because the cities are going to get a little bit of, you know, they're going to want to spend that money and think it's theirs. Right. That, that creates more challenges. I mean, I would, I guess I would ask the elected officials, is there any room within some of the CARES Act money that's available now at the state to try and address some of these shortfalls that are never going to happen because, you know, ne late next year, there's going to be a plethora of refund claims going to these, especially the larger cities or the cities that have headquartered companies. And they're going to, you know, that's going to be a multi-year battle. And if we could clarify what the law is there first and maybe use some of that money, is, is that a possibility to help kind of through the transition here? Mr. Shearer, maybe I'll turn, start with you if that's okay. You look like you're ready there. Sure. Sure. Um, well, number one, what we've learned uh, with the CARES Act dollar uh, is that, that the feds have put fairly, at least initially, had fairly tight restrictions on what the, uh, the CARES Act money could be used for. Um, had to be directly COVID-related, uh, you know, uh, PPP. Um, they, they then loosened it and say, all right, all right extra law enforcement um, can be part of what the uh, uh, local governments uh, use it for. Uh, um, whether this would qualify or not is the number one question that pops into my mind uh, when you mention that. Um, and the possibility that, that uh, Congress in, in, in its subsequent legislation, and they're talking about uh, care like uh, money coming out and if we might get Get some uh, some uh, specifically so far though, you're not we're not permitted to uh, to, to reimburse uh, local municipal local municipalities and, and other local governments lost revenue so um, it would I believe that it would take a change uh, at the federal level uh, for us to be able to consider that yeah it's a good point Senator anything you want to add about that or? <laughs> Unfortunately, uh, the representative saying so. If you could, that's what he said. Oh, yeah, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, Senator. So, uh, Representative Shearer was mentioning how they're prohibited right now under the federal law for to reimburse local governments for lost revenue through the CARES Act money. That that was correct. Okay. So, um. You know, it's interesting because a lot of the discussions here have been about how long this is going. So this is going on much longer than what folks had originally thought when Section 29 was enacted, for instance, and that type of thing. And uh, Steve Tom, had I, mentioned. Tom, if I could add, I'm, I'm sorry, just interrupt there. Sure. No, go ahead. Uh, when we, when we uh, d did distribute some of that CARES money uh, a couple, several months ago, I, I recall one of the discussions was, you know, we're not going to distribute all of it. We're going to hang on to some of it, uh, and it was for that reason because I, I think a lot of the uh, of us in the General Assembly were hoping that that federal law would change, uh, and then we would be able to uh, reimburse them for that lost revenue. And I think that was one of the reasons that we did hold on to some of that CARES money at the time. Oh, that's good. Good to know. Thank you. Um, by the way, folks, don't forget that you can use the chat function to uh, pose some questions. So don't hesitate to do that if there's something you'd like to ask the panelists here today. Um, Steve earlier was talking about what the principal place of work is. So according to what this, this provision in section 29 says, you we have to withhold to the principal place of work. And part of what he mentioned was the principal place of work, when we look at that cascading test of work location, fixed location, and then where you work 50% or more, you cannot uh, use the house of the employee except in that third and last test. And what that third and last test provides is that you look to where the employee is actually performing more than 50% of their services and throughout the year. 
And so at this point in the year, we are well past the number of days, you know, for January, February, and a little bit of March where folks were working in their real offices. And now we've got a majority of time that's now being spent working remotely at their home locations. So if we look to that third trigger, I mean, even under Section 29, that income might be interpreted to be taxed at the at the home or the resident of the employee. Steve, do, do you do you agree with that, or you see issues with that? I think I think what you're getting at is is that at some point the home does become the principal place of work, and therefore you're beyond 20 days in that bedroom community, and now arguably the employer has to withhold there if that's the read of it. But yes, I agree with with that logic. Um, Again. So employers, so employers could be actually not following Section Twenty Nine if they're not withholding to the house. Arguably, not arguably. saying go out, run out, and do that. Arguably, and then also arguably, maybe it creates a payroll factor in, arguably, in the uh, bedroom community for the net profits return. However, there's some language that says you only count wages paid at certain locations, which would not include a home. So there is a disconnect there in the law. There was a disconnect there in the law even before the COVID legislation though. I was sure. Sure. But this but this discussion almost it, it it sounds like every employee is doing the same thing. Right? But if you have a company where um, you know half of your employees are working from home but the other half of your employees are still working in the office or even out of that half that are working in the office Sometimes they do work at home and sometimes, you know, it's very fluid. And so from an employer's standpoint, we like the fact that employees have the responsibility to true that up at the end of the year, right? Because they know best about if they work from home on this Friday, the next Thursday, or what was happening, that's a lot for an employer to be managing through this pandemic where it isn't one size fits all. That's a great point. Amy out of Rita, I mean, what do you, what does Rita think about all this, or some of this discussion? Or at least what do you think I should say? No, I, what I can tell you is that we have not seen any large shifts in withholding. Um, so, you, you know, no businesses where all of a sudden the withholding has disappeared that would tell us that they're doing something other than continuing to withhold for the principal place of work. So I think for the most part, employers are continuing to follow House Bill 197 and simply withhold for the principal place of work. We're not seeing a big shift. Um, we occasionally will get a call from an employer that says, you know, my employees want me to change the withholding. We simply point them back to House Bill 197. And we always encourage employees, you know, even pre-pandemic, if you are a person who works in different places, it's always a good idea to track. So that that still applies, that employees should still be tracking. Um, but for the most part, employers are still uh, following, withholding as they were in February. Tom, could I add a point? You, you know, nothing, pro, uh, COVID or not, nothing would prohibit an employer from changing the person's principal place of work based on the cascading test if they know the person is going to stay at home a lot and therefore doesn't need test one or test two. Therefore, you know, the effect of that is that the bedroom community gets the tax. Yeah. A lot, a lot of issues, a lot of problems. We've, we spent a lot of time talking about the withholding issues. And again, that's been the biggest issue that we face with our clients um, because right now that's something they have to deal with today. Now, down the road, they're going to have to deal with some other issues as we get beyond the year and have to look back and file other returns. And so, Eleanor, are there other types of tax taxes that we need to be thinking about for businesses as they work through the COVID pandemic? Well, yeah, because as soon as you go and change your... Um employee location work from you know principal place of work location does that create a net profits tax responsibility in that city um you know that's something to look at too you know we've we we've looked at um 
you know, we have technology that we're trying to roll out to our um, employees or even the technology um, spend per diem type of thing. How is that taxed? So other issues work from home, you know, computers and things that we're giving office chairs and desks, we're giving employees money to, to set up their home offices. How, how do we tax, how do we tax that? So, and just to clarify for all the uh, participants in today's panel, Ohio, we've been talking about the withholding tax for individual employees, but the municipal tax also imposes an income tax on the businesses and the employers themselves. And that's what we refer to as the net profits tax. And so Eleanor's pointing out that, well, now do you have to file a net profits tax in these bedroom communities where their employees are staying and working and that type of thing? And I guess I would ask Amy what, what she thinks uh, about that. Are they going to be expected to be filing net profit returns? Well, Tom, I'm, I'm not so sure that the, the payroll is the problem. As Steve pointed out, uh, there are a couple of things in the law already that, that try to address that. And the payroll with respect to net profit, you're looking at wages paid at a location that's controlled or, or something that's um, within the scope of the employer. And, and would an employee's home qualify for that? Not sure. Um, I, I think where you might there might be a question and we're still looking at this is, you know, services that the employees are now performing um, on behalf of their employers and the customers from their homes. Is that creating now, um, uh, you, you know, a filing requirement for employers where their employees are providing those services. So I, I think on the net profit issue, there's still some things to be answered. I know that's kind of the next thing that we're looking at. Um, as far as what the impact of this is going to be next year with returns being filed. Okay, great, thank you. Um, so Eleanor, you mentioned about the net profits tax for municipal income tax purposes. What about states and some of the issues? Yeah, definitely. I mean, you you know, where where are your people, you know, where your people work often creates an exit um, for you. and. Um, then, you know, they have, you know, there's not that many states left that have a personal property tax, but some still do. And so, you know, now they have a, their computer, right, at their home location. And are we tracking that for personal property tax filing compliance? It's a great point. And, and on our website at zhftaxlaw.com, we have a page for COVID-19 related discussions and links and, and some good information. And within that, there's a multi-state tab. And in that multi-state tab, there's a state and local corporate income tax nexus guide. So many states across the country, I think, have, have, have provided some guides about whether if you have an a, a employee remotely working in the state because of covid Here's what we're thinking in terms of the, the liability from a, a income tax or a franchise tax perspective. But I'd like to ask Fred what he's seeing in terms of these of states across the country and how they are either providing guidance or whether it's good or bad guidance, you know, and, and what concerns for the businesses have been. Thanks, Tom. Appreciate that. And um, before we completely move off the Ohio municipal income tax, just really want to um, you know, note that I hope um, all these problems that are surfacing are going to create opportunities where the legislature can act. And you know, one of the major concerns um, is Cleveland, Columbus, Cincinnati, big cities, um, you know, you're going to have a fairly large liability. So the cost of compliance versus the tax um, that's owed isn't that big of an issue. But our members, you know, some of the smaller localities in Ohio, the cost of compliance is um, so great. And so that can be something that's, you know, also looked at um, beyond just the withholding issues. But um, you know, from the COVID-19 issues and um, complying with state and local taxes across the country, you know, I, I really put that in a couple buckets. And the first one is, I think for good tax administration on the business side and also on the government side, is we got to eliminate paper. Um, you know, we have uh, on the government side, the employees are working at home. So being able to uh, open mail and process returns and process those payments, it becomes a lot more difficult. And from the business side, um, when you have to try to process a paper return and you need a wet signature from an officer or some states um, or some localities and states require notarized statements, 
that makes things um, very problematic. So we've been trying to work to try to get uh, on state laws to eliminate those types of requirements. And, um, you know, the biggest complaint we've heard um, in the property tax area, um, when it comes to personal property, um, the states that have that, filing the renditions on the returns by paper is, is very difficult. It's much easier if you can do it electronically. And some of the localities um, with the local lodging taxes and also um, with the property taxes, oftentimes that has to be done on um, using a paper check. And it's really, really hard when you don't have um, an employee in the office to start processing paper checks. Um, so 15, 20 years ago, um, a lot of folks, you know, they heard from the business community saying that, you know, we don't think this electronic filing is fair. Um, that has definitely shifted. And now we have a lot of businesses that are pushing for the local governments. You need to get there. You need to start having good electronic filing payment systems. The other is um, just dealing with um, having extensions. Um, for all taxes, for all types of taxpayers, um, Ohio, um, you know, unfortunately, you know, it gave the ability, broad ability for the commissioner to uh, extend taxes. However, um, the primary focus was just on the individual side. Um, but um, we we did see some states, you know, broadly provide extensions to a lot of the taxes, um, you know, sales tax, property taxes. Um, but the vast majority of the states um, were fairly limited on what they did provide for extensions and. That's you know been problematic when you have a lot of folks dealing with reshifting how they're um, setting up their workspace in the COVID nineteen type of environment. And then you know Eleanor you know started talking about um, the issues with uh, working at home. We talked a lot about the municipal income tax, but um, it sure does bring a lot of nexus issues um, up for the businesses and apportionment um, issues. Uh, and that's something that a lot of our members have uh, to be concerned with. And quite frankly, um, you know, our membership is you know, Fortune 500 um, membership for the most part, but uh, small businesses should be even more concerned um, because um, a lot of our businesses, they have uh, nexus in all 50 states, um, but uh, the smaller businesses and how things are getting reshuffled where they thought they you know, had a limited presence in other states, that could really be changing with the COVID-19 and having employees work, working um, at, at home environment. So those are um, major concerns. Um, you know, you have to worry about the payroll factor. Are there going to be um, required shifts there? Um, property factor, as Eleanor alluded to, um, computers. Um, I mean, there was a teleworking case uh, for a person having a computer in New Jersey uh, working. So, you know, that is a form of property um, and, you know, it may not have a huge impact, but if um, you're on, um, if your business is on a border with another state, um, you have a lot of people all of a sudden using expensive computer equipment in another state. You know, that, that could potentially uh, make a difference. Um, one thing that Ohio um, doesn't really have a problem with uh, directly, but uh, I think it's important to note that in other states, um, such as New York is probably uh, the biggest poster child for this, is some states have what's known as a complaint convenience of the employer test. So even though an employee may be working at home, and this is even before COVID-19, um, if the employer's uh, employee's um, headquarters was in um, another state um, where they were not a resident, um, states like New York would say that um, you still owe our individual income tax based on where your um, employer is located, not based on where you're actually working. So the convenience of an employer, um, that's been creeping up. Um, uh, it's not just New York, uh, you have Arkansas, Connecticut, Delaware, uh, and Pennsylvania that also have that type of rule. Um, where it's really made a stink lately um, is Massachusetts just put out a rule post um, during COVID-19 to say that uh, that's what they were uh, interpreting a lot to be, is that you should be uh, you know, subject to the tax, um, even if you're not working that location because your employer is located there. And it's not limited just to um, the states. Uh, I, I just saw something um, a couple of days ago where the city of St. Louis, um, they have uh, an earned uh, income uh, tax there and uh, the city of St. Louis is saying the same thing. So this is um, something that has been spreading. Um, a lot of folks, you know, I think uh, look at this as um, being potentially unconstitutional. Um, Congress has looked at it um, just recently, um, a couple uh, a couple weeks ago, there was legislation introduced by Representative Pappas out of New Hampshire New Hampshire doesn't have an income tax, but it does border Massachusetts. So they're not happy. So they're trying to eliminate the convenience of the employer rule. Um, there has been legislation introduced before. There was some in 2016 and that didn't happen. Um, 
mean, I, I think the constitution of um, what these states are trying to do is suspect, but um, unfortunately, um, again, while the U.S. Supreme Court denying cert does not mean that they were accepting uh, a lower court's decision as that being the law, but there was a case that did go up to the U.S. Supreme Court about 15 years ago, um, and they didn't take it. Um, and so again, we, we, review denied does not mean um, acceptance at all. Um, Tom, do you want me to talk a little bit about, you know, why um, being some reporter test um, is not an issue for Ohio and the surrounding states? Where yeah, well, well, yeah, absolutely, because I think that's important. And, and, and explain what you mean by that. Yeah, so um, Ohio, um, back when it started imposing its income tax back in 1972, was very fortunate in that um, it has a reciprocity agreement with all five of its surrounding states. And I think it's fairly unprecedented for a state to have um, reciprocity agreements on who, which state is going to get the income tax um, for a, a person working in a state where they're not a resident. Um, so you have, you know, a person working in Ohio, but they're really a resident of Kentucky, or they could be um, working in Pennsylvania, but they're really a resident of Ohio. And Ohio, since 1972, um, has had a voluntary agreement with all of its neighboring states saying that uh, the state of residency is going to control. Um, so that's why this isn't as big of an issue in Ohio as it is for other states. Um, and we're not seeing the state versus state battle with our neighboring states because Ohio has had this um, long held reciprocity provision in, all, in, its, um, in its law and um, they've had agreements with the state. And I have to give kudos, a lot of kudos for that um, to Ohio because um, there's probably more non-residents, uh, non-Ohio residents working in Ohio. Um, so it's not a money uh, winner um, for the state. But uh, I think it is a really good, um, important thing for the state to have. Yeah. I know that when I was commissioner, we, we saw that as a revenue loser for the state, those agreements, but it's such a convenience for employers. It's uh, definitely worth it. Yeah. So, so Fred, you, you mentioned Congress, you mentioned how they have you at least alluded to the fact that they have the ability to regulate interstate commerce. Do you see any efforts at the congressional level to maybe address some of these COVID uh, pandemic remote working issues. Yeah, thanks, Tom. You know, we've been trying uh, at the Council on State Taxation, working with the um, AICPAs and the Payroll Association for over 12 years um, to try to get Congress to pass some legislation to provide some clear, uniform rules. And I, I really stress uniform rules that all the states um, would use for when they can impose their tax on non-residents. And it's been a struggle. Um, and quite frankly, um, the struggle has been the state of New York. Um, the state of New York has uh, traditionally always been very aggressive going after non-residents that are working in their state, especially if they're high paid um, non-residents. Um, but uh, the mobile workforce, um, it, it's been introduced in Congress um, for the last six uh, sessions. And it has actually passed the House um, several times. Um, and then when it gets to the Senate, uh, we have a little issue with New York and um, Senator Schumer. Um, so Senator Schumer is the uh, Senate mi uh, minority leader, and of course he's from New York. Um, so we haven't been able to get the bill to move um, in the Senate. Um, Sherrod Brown, um, really want to give uh, him thanks. Um, you know, Sherrod Brown from Ohio, uh, Senator Sherrod Brown has been a sponsor of this legislation um, for several sessions, um, and we appreciate his leadership in helping us out there. The current bill that we have on mobile workforce, and that is you know, before um, a state can pose its income tax on a non-resident, that non-resident would have to be working in the jurisdiction for more than 30 days. And there are exceptions. If you happen to be a professional athlete, if you're a professional um, speaker or entertainer, um, sorry, but you know, you're, you're excluded from um, that safe harbor. But um, it does provide some really good um, protections. The bill out there right now uh, is um, Senate Bill 30, 3995. Um, and I, I, I'm really pleased, Tom, to let you know that um, the work that the Senate has been putting on to um, provide additional COVID relief, it's the Health Economic Assistance Liability Protection um, and Schools Act. Um, the HEALS Act is the acronym that it's known for. That is Senate Bill uh, 4318. That does con um, contain the mobile workforce provisions. Um, directly related to providing COVID relief, um, rather than 30 days, um, there's a 90-day provision for 2020 for um, this calendar year. 
Also, it addresses um, apportionment issues and nexus issues. Uh, it pretty much says that um, for um, apportionment purposes and for nexus, you can't use the fact that you have um, employers working at home um, as a basis for nexus, and you don't have to include them for changing your apportionment factors. Um, the only downside, the only concern um, was well, two. One is, you know, what's going to pass um, and when uh, um, is it going to pass? And this bill does have an expiration date for the mobile workforce provisions. Um, it would expire at the end of 2024. And that's something that we're not in the prior mobile workforce um, provisions. So what do you think businesses could, should be doing in order to encourage adoption? By yeah, um, this is per appreciated, Tom. This is the perfect time for, um, as a business, your association, um, any type of law firm, accounting firm. Um, we're really looking to get names on a joint letter that um, cost and the AICPA will be sending to Congress, um, pushing for them to enact a mobile workforce provision, either separately or part of um, any COVID-19 um, legislation that moves um, before the U.S. Senate and the U.S. House. Yeah. If you could email Tom or myself, um, we will get you the information so that you can add your business to that list. So yeah. I be, appreciate that plug, Tom. Um, we need to get it really soon, though. We, we really need it by, I believe, the end of business tomorrow, if you could. Okay. So everybody needs to act fast. It's important, and it's been lingering in Congress for years and years. And so I, if we have an opportunity to get it through, it, it makes sense to go ahead and do that. Uh, very quickly, just a, a, we did get a couple questions. One is, is, how does all this impact sales and use tax on contract labor? I would just tell you that I don't think any of this does. I mean, the provisions relate to contract labor is where's the labor being performed. And so that's where the uh, sales tax has incidents. But one, and I don't want to turn this person in, but I'm going to direct this at Amy first and anybody else who wants to chime in, says, my IT consultants were told not to come to their normal workplace, but instead to work from home. So as a business, I am taking withholding tax from their home location. Is this correct? So, Amy, I guess I would ask you that question first. Um, thanks, Tom. Oh, that's Amy. Hi. That's not Amy. <laughs> John, I'll fix that. Just a second. Um, there you go. You know, that's, that is really the exact issue uh, that the Buckeye Institute raised in its lawsuit against the city of Columbus, that it was forced to uh, send its employees home because of the stay-at-home order and forced to continue to withhold the Columbus tax. Uh, and, and that's really, you know, what's behind their, um, their, their complaint in that case. Um, you know, whether what this particular employer is doing or not, you know, there's still that argument as Steve brought up. Um, you know, there were many employers before uh, COVID who were tracking and withholding based on exactly where their employees were working. And those employers, uh, for the most part, like I said, we have not seen any large shifts in withholding or big changes. So it appears that those employers are continuing to do that. Um, you know, what I can say is when we do get that question from employers, we do point them to House Bill 197 because usually they don't want to make the switch to the employees' workplaces, or I'm sorry, to their homes uh, because it's more challenging. Um, but again, that, that, that's pretty much the fact scenario in that Buckeye Institute case. And, and hopefully we'll uh, have some clarity either through the litigation or through some additional legislation uh, to let us know how that's all going to fall out. And earlier, and if I could interject, Tom, earlier, yes. you know, Steve made the comment, and I don't see him here, but he made the comment you know, at any point the employer can change the employee's principal place of work. And I just, is that true? <laughs> you know, I, I think House Bill 197 would tell us otherwise. And I'm, I'm, I'm hearing that there's some not, there's not clarity there. Right. And since we're not giving legal advice today, <laughs> I would just point, out, just point out that it's, to me, it is unclear. There's certainly a position argument. Steve, anything you want to leave off there? You know, in light of the Buckeye case, yeah. the Buckeye I, I was kicked off for a couple, a couple minutes, yeah. missed a couple minutes of that. But first comment I would make, the, the Buckeye lawsuit is a little unusual the way they, uh, 
are attempting to get their point across because you know when you file a refund claim with the city it's not like that city has to act in one day or two days or three days um so there might be some issues with their attempt uh, to what they're trying to do um but without regard to the house bill 197 non codified law i don't see any problem at all with changing the person's principal place of work as long as they are not required to report somewhere else as long as they don't need test one or test two and that becomes their principal place of work because it's where they work more than any other day but more than any other time during the year yeah so at the end of the day it's it is really unclear and i think it's important for all businesses to talk to their tax advisors and think about their actual facts and circumstances and the risks associated with all this working remotely. And of course, we all encourage the elected officials to who have been here today and the other folks who are out there to think about these issues and see if we can't provide businesses some certainty around. You know, that's the biggest problem I think that businesses face is they just want certainty. They want to obey the law, but boy, they need to understand what the law is. And so, we want to do right by our employees too. I mean, we, you know, we talk about the fact that it's not really our money, but we do want to do right by our employees. And we don't want to have them be turned away by Columbus to get a refund and then Columbus force them to litigate, which, you know, the average Joe is not going to litigate a tax issue with the city of Columbus. And so it, it, it's a double edged sword for us as employers because. We're, we're trying to get it right from both sides. And, and I would echo what, what Fred mentioned earlier about uh, the senator's proposed bill, maybe adding a little bit more clarity on how it's going to operate as opposed to just saying we repeal that section since we're not clear what that section means in the first place, let alone what a repeal of it. <laughs> <laughs> this has all been actually, I think, very helpful conversation for me because uh, and I'm, I'm sure Representative Sheriff feels the same way that what we want to do is make sure that there is clarity for not only employees, uh, we don't want to make, make it easier. That's great. Well, we, we ran obviously past one because we started past noon, um, but we're, we're at the end of our time. I really appreciate all the panelists who have been with us today. So I ask all the participants to at least remotely thank them for their participation today and their insight. Um, I do encourage you that if you're on our YouTube channel, please, again, subscribe to our channel as, as well as hit the like button. Um, that, that's also very important. So we would really appreciate your consideration of that. Again, thank you for joining us and have a great day and stay healthy. Take care, everybody. Bye-bye. Thank you.